OK, so before we get started, I'm going to allow each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us very briefly what they do. Um, and then we will proceed with the, the questions and the discussion. Hello, um, my name is Andrew Sheeran. Um, I run a company called Terrible Games. We design, oh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> we're perhaps best known for War on Terror, the board game, and we design satirical political games. Um, usually traditional games, but we're actually trying to make War on Terror into an iPhone game at the moment, which may or may not work. But uh, that's us. Hi, I'm James Wallace. I come from Space, which is a London-based games consultancy. Um, I'm a multidisciplinarian. I uh, design tabletop and digital games, web games, social games. Um, my background is tabletop roleplay. I'm best known for storytelling and narrative-based games, particularly the card-based storytelling game, Once Upon a Time, and the drunken storytelling game, Baron Munchausen. Uh, that was unexpected. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rainer Knizia. <laughs> I have designed one game, but it has not been very recognized. It calls, it's called Kakak Kukak. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Doug Wilson. I'm a uh, researcher and PhD candidate at the IT University of Copenhagen, uh, where I teach a class on board game and card game design. Uh, and I'm also a game developer. I'm really interested in folk games and um, designing digitally enabled folk games for the Kinect and the PlayStation Move and the Wii. Hi, I'm Chris Bateman. I run a company called International Hobo. I got into game design uh, hoping to do, do tabletop games, totally failed to make any money at it, and have been forced to make video games instead. Uh, I'm now attempting to uh, justify all of the horrible video games I've made uh, with a book I have come out in November called Imaginary Games, which makes a robust philosophical case for uh, the status of all games as art, including board games. Yeah. Hello, I'm Omar Safas. I'm a gamer. Um, I founded a group, the Phoenix Board Game Foundation in the Netherlands. Um, we play games a lot. Uh, we translate games. About 40% of the board games in the Netherlands are translated throughout our group. And, um, well, we, we try to bring people in contact with each other on board games. So uh, we visit all kinds of events and uh, try to promote board games as much as possible. Okay, uh, okay thanks everybody. Um, so we've got a few open points or discussion sort of questions that we're going to set you off on. So uh, feel free to get going. So uh, we'll start off with... An, a very open one, and that is, uh, can you tell us some of the trends that you see in board games, like modern, that are coming out around now, where do you see it going? Where do we see it? I know, anybody. <laughs> They'll get harder. Uh, just to start, I, I, I thought the, um, it was the who was it, right, the, the game, I, I think that's indicative of a trend that I'm actually quite happy about, which is, um, I would say, like heterogeneity or these, these type of hybrid games um, that aren't just traditional board games about the mechanics but come with like, either weird sculptural or multimedia elements. Right? Another great example would be Space Alert, uh, which I thought is like one of the strongest, strongest games of the last. It comes with an audio CD, and so you're listening to this crazy soundtrack from the CD while you play the game, kind of doing what the soundtrack tells you to do. And it's... Um, kind of, kind of like your game. It was, sets the right atmosphere, um, but doesn't completely control the game because it's not a computer. It's just a CD. Um, so, and all sorts of strange, you know, sculptural games. Um, I, I see more and more. So, uh, to me, that's a, it's a cool thing. These hybrid games. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. A lot of hybrid stuff is coming through at the moment. I, I saw recently, my Japanese isn't good enough to know what it's called, but a Three Kingdoms themed trading card game in the arcades whereby you buy a starter deck, you then play a, a real-time strategy game using cards as the controller, and then after the game, the cabinet spits out more cards as a reward for you to keep playing. Uh, it's really one of the strangest things I've seen, and, and definitely in the interface between video games and board games. I think to pick up the, the same point, the, the who was it, uh, we're seeing a lot of collaborative board games where you're working together against the game engine, whether that's digital or encoded within the rules and the, the, the 
the algorithm of the game system itself. Um, pandemic, uh, space alert is another one. Um, and this is possibly derived from or feeding into a new movement that's coming out of role-playing games, the indie RPGs, um, which is a trend about 10 years old now, but really, really steamrolling ahead. Some fantastic collaborative storytelling games. Um, Fiasco, probably the big flag waver at the moment, which is a collaborative storytelling game which you basically tell a, a caper movie directed by the Coen brothers in which some inept crooks conduct a crime and then it goes wrong and they turn on each other. Um, brilliant mechanics, absolutely brilliant. Um, great stories come out of it and it's huge fun to play. Can I ask, you mentioned indie RPGs, which interests me because I failed as an indie RPG uh, designer in the 90s. So are, are indie RPGs now uh, profitable? Can people actually survive making them or do they have to do them as hobbies? They're monstrously unprofitable. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like to claim that Baron Munchausen was the first indie RPG. It was the first kind of small format 24-page RPG um, and that was 1998. And that sold 4,000 copies originally, which was fantastic. A lot of the I think Tunnels and Trolls uh, was probably the first small format game. That was yeah. the, roughly the same number of, of uh, pages, and that was, was the second second RPG made. Sixty pages. Sixty pages was it? at least. Ah, yeah. uh, all right. But um, <laughs> but um, no, a lot of the, the indie RPG designers actually release their their sales figures, and you know a few of them break a thousand copies, and and that's nice for them. But there aren't many actually making any kind of decent profit or living out. Are of there it. any? Um, I think some of the guys have set up companies to publish other people's games and there's distribution companies so it's kind of they're making money out of the games but no one's making a living as an indie RPG designer. Talking about not making money, when we talk about trends, of course the trend will always also go where the money is. So uh, when you can make money on Facebook because you have mic microtransactions, you might have many more interactivities there. Uh, so that's one trend I see. The other trend is electronics. Uh, we talked about uh, the hybrid game. If you look at a washing machine today, nobody notices that there's lots of electronics in there. I think in two years' time you'll be able to watch television on the washing machine, yes? Because you have a little monitor and everything will be interconnected. Uh, so it, it would be quite unnatural that the electronics stays out of our games. That doesn't mean I'm glued to the screen. It means I'm playing as I used to play, but there's just an electronic support there, which is most natural and should not even be noticed a lot. I think we make much too much of a distinction between these are the pure, good, non-electronic games and these are the sometimes bad electronic games. It's just nonsense. It, it's just a natural development. Third point I see is, in the short term, trends are often, often lucky, random. You get one game which is successful, and the whole industry, not the whole industry, a lot run there. You have Trivial Pursuit, or you have Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and then suddenly you get lots of these quiz games. You have something else, which is a success, you do more of them. We were very successful with the hybrid game. I'm sure there will be more hybrid games. It's, that's where the market goes, and what is successful is sometimes very lucky, so we have a random trend in a way where we go on the short-term basis, long-term, as said. Um, we are involved in a project with uh, some telephone companies and some game companies and some technology design companies uh, where they are tr looking for a way um, to interact with other players around the world in a way, well, like Rainer described, you have to see each other. Um, we, we, we sat one evening with each other and then we talked about uh, how can we arrange something like that? You want to have a table and uh, the other players on the other side of the world have to be on your table. How can we arrange something like that? Um, you want to be in a way, working in a way that you have the same game on your table so the opposite side can see what you have on the table and you can see what the opposite side has on the table. For some idea, there was something like, well, if I put my hands across the table, the other side should see my hand coming. It would be nice to have something like that in 3D. And while talking, more and more ideas came like, well, the background should be the same. We should be, have a feeling like we were in one room. How can we arrange something like that? 
then the idea came, well, maybe can, we can put a, a green screen behind it and we can put similar uh, backgrounds on each other's screens. The ideas became more and more concrete and they are looking for ways how, uh, how to create a system that could be working like that at the moment. And um, I think it would be a nice way to play with each other because in that way you can combine um, the electronic part of, board uh, of a game with uh, the basic board game and uh, be together across the world. And that could be a complete new dimension in playing because, well, when you play at, at, an, at, an, uh, at a system like Bradgefield World, where people get involved with each other and have contacts with each other, people like that. People like to be with each other in one game on a global level. But when you can arrange something like that and you can see each other and you can socialize with each other, you would get an, a, a complete new dimension. Um, I'd just like to disagree with pretty much everyone and, uh, <laughs> and also present a, a slightly more pessimistic uh, view of, of the industry uh, because this all does sound very positive at the moment. Um, it, uh, board game design and production as kind of like an, an indie um, event is still very strong, but I think there's no doubt that the industry is is in decline and is is fairly moribund. Um, it was in an interesting state a few years ago, where adult board game sales were actually steadily rising and and one of the few areas of the market that were. And then since the we came along and kind of t uh, snatched away a huge part of the family board game market that kind of set in a real panic, I think, in especially the larger producers. And, and I, for one, I'm, I'm not a fan of hybridization at all. I, I think, um, by and large, it's, it's, it's a it's real It's too expensive rot. for you to try. <laughs> well, well, no, it's, it's, it's not. That, that's, that's what I, I really object to. I don't, it's not expensive at all to produce these electronics, but you can add an extra 10 or 15 pounds to your price tag when you sell it to the consumer. And, and I think that, um, that pattern started with these awful DVD games that kind of got produced in, in like the late 90s, which was basically a really substandard game with a DVD in it. And you had to pay 45 pounds when the going rate for a game at that time was like 20 pounds or whatever. So I think um, with some notable exceptions, of course, uh, Rona, although I haven't, I haven't, I haven't played Vervas, um, Hybridization, I think, is just an excuse to, to sell you more plastic shit. Um, and, and, um, and to try and keep up with the Joneses, the electronic Joneses. And, and I think that's just totally the wrong way to go. Um, so from my point of view, I think that although the board game art industry is heading in that way, it is heading towards hybridization and, and a digitization of the board game. I think that's, that's a big mistake. Um, personally, I think apart from anything else, when the oil runs out, we need something to play. So, uh. <coughs> um, and the other problem with hybridization and computer-based, digital-based, non-video games is that the development costs are way, way higher. I worked, I did some work on Eye of Judgment, the PlayStation 3 card game that was an actual card game with a down-facing video camera that detected what cards were being played and animated them on the screen. It was a lovely idea. Um, it uh, it didn't do well. Um, but uh, the other thing is, I think the reason for your pessimism, the Europeans, the, main, the continental Europeans may not get this, but in the UK and in America, uh, which is the, the rest of the bulk of the board game market, the market for board games is Hasbro products, essentially. It's Monopoly, it's Cluedo, it's Scrabble. That is what you will find in, in non-specialist game shops. Uh, over here, I, I, I gathered, you can walk into any general... Uh, store, you know, a, a big supermarket will have copies of Settlers of Catan. Oh God, I wish that was the case for us, but no, for us, it's it's Hasbro, it's it's Monopoly. I had a meeting with Hasbro earlier this year. I, I won't say who with, but I was proposing alterations to Monopoly, strangely enough, and they leant across the table before they'd actually heard my idea and said, James, we have to tell you, we don't think Monopoly is a very good game. Well, no one's going to fix it unless you do. So. Yeah, it's so it's 
board games which aren't very good, and the trouble with Monopoly is no one actually plays by the printed rules, which are a decent game. Everyone ha gets rid of the stuff that's, not, that's a bit cruel and a bit heartless because it's a social game you're playing with your friends, and that turns it into a game that lasts forever and is very dull. Um, and, and nothing is going to change that status quo. I love the fact that Hasbro have teamed up with Pizza Hut to do family game night and they're TV advertising this stuff. I hate the fact that the games they're advertising are not good games, are not the games that make you, that are going to make you want to play more games. Um, and that situation is, I don't think, unless something really radical happens, is not going to change. Well, I, I, I kind of agree with you. I mean, certainly I look at something like the new Monopoly Live that comes with, that comes with this crazy, this is, this is true, by the way, a crazy infrared computer tower in the middle of the board and enforces that you're actually moving the pieces and the right... Um, so I, I, it, it plays I, the game for you. Yeah, essentially. So I mean, I, I, when I see that type of thing, I share your concern. At the same time, I think it's not so black and white. Like I do think if we're clever, there are low cost, really valuable hybridization opportunities. And I think to just to defend hybridity um, in terms of <laughs> board games for a second, I mean, I think what to me is really exciting is that there's this whole space between games as a medium and all sorts of other mediums from music right, or, or to written, the written word or spoken word to uh, performance and dance. And so I think that's really exciting to see media come together in ways they haven't before. So I would, I, I think you're being a little too um, unilaterally harsh on the idea of hybrid games. I, I, I share your concern and we need to be, I agree, concerned about these like techno fetishistic hybrids like Monopoly Live, but there, there are cool other hybrids. I don't think it's so black and white. But. And since, oh, sorry, uh, since the, uh, Hasbro came up, um, you mentioned Hasbro in the, the sort of the context of uh, the sort of mainstream, uh, the original casual games that are 100 years old rather than 10 years old. Uh, but of course, Hasbro owns uh, Wizards of the Coast and Wizards of the Coast own TSR. So Hasbro are also responsible for the, um, one of the most, well, the most successful trading card game and one of the most successful board games by revenue, Magic the Gathering. Uh, and Dungeons and & Dragons, which despite its dip, is still probably uh, the, the king of sales in, in role-playing games. Uh, what do you think about the fact that uh, Hasbro has acquired these properties? Uh, I, either of you, anyone in fact. <laughs> um, I don't know enough about the inner workings of Wizards of the Coast these days. They claim that Hasbro uh, come along every year with a sack, of, uh, sack and tell them to fill it with money, and if they do, they can carry on doing what they like. It's, I mean, I can believe it, but... Um, I know. It's I mean, true they, story. They continue coming out with interesting products. They they did an awful version of Sid Saxon's Acquire, which for which I will not forgive them. <laughs> um, horrible cardboard pieces instead of the lovely plastic ones. Um, but it's, I I don't know. It's at least they're they're not screwing up Dungeons and Dragons as badly as TSR were <laughs> at the point Wizards took them over. TSR, who refused to take the word advanced off the front of the game because that would have meant paying a royalty to Dave Arneson if they'd just call it Dungeons & Dragons. No one's going to start role-playing with the advanced game. Yeah. There was no introductory game for Dungeons & Dragons for the best part of 10 years. And that was an awful situation. Wizards fixed that. The con situation continues to be fixed. Um, I'm told they're doing good work. I, it's, I know too many of the lead designers well to <laughs> be objective about it. What worries me is that uh, Hasbro also bought Avalon Hill, mm. and um, well, Avalon. Wizards bought Avalon. Yeah, well, um, but but a lot of great designs uh, that were made for Avalon Hill um, disappeared into the case of of Hasbro and never came out again. And um, well, a lot of good stuff and 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 a lot of good board games have have. Well, nowadays people are willing to pay over 150 euros for an old copy of games that used to be from Avalon Hill. And that's, that's a strange thing. And you should think that um, Hasbro might see something like that and might realize that, that, one, that they can earn money by re-releasing these games. Do you think they can actually make much money re-releasing the games? The reason it's they're, they're going for so much money is because they're a piece of gaming history. But reissuing them, the, the audience probably isn't there. Those Avalon Hill games were absolutely vital to the history of games. We wouldn't have had D&D &D without them. And without D&D, &D, we wouldn't have 
World of Warcraft or Call of Duty even owes a game design debt, um, as does just about everything on Facebook. Yeah. So Avalon Hill is an important part of the history of games, but are any of those games actually still playable by today's standards? Because, you know, board games have got faster yeah. to play and easier to understand, and the Avalon Hill games, much as I love them, were neither of those things. That's true. That's true, but there is still a, gr a group of fans who are willing to pay such an amount of money just for an old copy. And we, we ought to realize that um, materials that are nowadays used in computer games, like Tech Tree, which is very important nowadays in all kinds of games, um, they started with Evelyn Hill. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Tech Tree, uh, Hex uh, movement, facings, zones of control, all Avalon Hill inventions. Yeah. No, I, like I say, it's absolutely vital to the history of games, but I question whether or not Hasbro, or for that matter TSR, can see any uh, value in, in reissuing those games today. I feel like if they did, they would want to use the brand and remake the game, which would be kind of counterproductive. Okay, but there are other, other companies who are willing to, uh, to re-release those games, and they can't get to the rights because Evelyn Hill has them. This is a classic problem in games of all kinds, is that rights get swallowed up by big corporations and are never released. So EA bought Bullfrog, made no, um, no, they made one title that followed on one of Bullfrog's um, uh, games. They made another Populous and then scrapped every single one of those franchises, even though there were plenty of mid-sized developers and publishers who would have been happy to carry on those franchises. They were too small for EA. And what you're saying here is the same situation in board games with uh, Hasbro and Avalon Hill. Sorry, we, we've monopolized discussion. We should let the other side of the table take it back. I was just going to say, you, in that case, if you really want to re-release these games, do what people do with Elite. There's never going to be a re a re an official re-release of Elite, but people clone it. People write their own versions. Yeah. There's no copyright in game mechanics. There's no copyright in the Thankfully. design of boards. Clone it. Do, do a clone game. Make it quite clear that it is based heavily on... Uh, rewrite the rules in your own language. You're clear and free on copyright. Mor morality, if the designer gives it his blessing or is dead... Um, then you're probably f that you're, you're probably karmically fine as well. Well, for some game designers. I think you're very on very uh, dangerous ground here because uh, I think you're digging your own hole. Uh, I think we have problems uh, legally to upholding uh, intellectual property rights in games. Uh, there's a there's quite a, a code of uh, how people treat each other and what they copy and what they don't copy from each other. And I think we very much depend on it, particularly as designers, because otherwise, um, if it's a free-for-all, um, if you cannot protect your work anymore, then who wants to put in uh, serious work if it's copied right away? Uh, it's copied in, in China anyway. Um, even so, I have, I have won a legal case against a Chinese company for copying. So... Be a bit careful about that. Tell something who your lawyers are. <laughs> it's a Chinese lawyer. <laughs> yes, of course. So it's a, it's a dangerous ground, um, the copying stuff. Uh, I think we just have to accept that some of the games disappear. What do you do if a designer dies and uh, you cannot access uh, the rights anymore? Do you have the right to copy it? Um, I have my doubts. I have probably higher... Well, I don't want to talk about moral, but I have higher stand standards of accepting uh, that uh, people want to protect their works. Yes, so dangerous. Uh, don't agree with you. Do Dr. Kinesia, where would you draw the line between um, inspiration and plagiarism? Because this is a, a major topic in game design of all kinds these days. In, in the end, I think... If you look into your heart, I mean, I'm, I'm making a <laughs> strange statement, but I think you know if you have copied and stolen or if you have done your own design. Uh, the lawyers can drift it to one side or the other side or whatsoever. I think if, and if, the, if you look into the board games geek and if you look at people who understand a little bit about the games, they will know this is a copy or this is something independent. Um, and how you then can do it legally is something, something different. But I think in your heart you know what you have done and if you're honest to yourself, you know if I've copied or I've done my own work. It's difficult with lawyers to say, look into your heart. Uh, I, so. <laughs> yes, uh, as I say, lawyers will do anything to win the case. They might even tell the truth. <laughs> and let me tell you, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> okay, should we uh, just interrupt you there? And um, Yes, can we have the second question? The please? second. <laughs> I think the open one went quite well. You've been about half an hour on it. So uh, we've got quite a heavy one here that we've been saving for you. And so... 
in game studies as a community of research, there's a, a long, hard-fought war with many bruises and <laughs> wounds um, about the regarding the difference between rules and the narrative of a game. And this uh, has parallels in, uh, in board games with the tension between theme and mechanics. So I wondered if uh, any member of the, the panel would like to discuss that. Um, I'll, I'll wade in since I have. Um, the, uh, the, the line is always artificial. Uh, I, I make the, uh, a philosophical argument that the rules entail fiction and the fiction obviously entails fiction. So we're distinguishing between one kind of fiction and another kind of fiction. Uh, and they merge into each other. And you can, you can distinguish them. You can make the kind of distinction Jewel makes between fiction and rules. But you can't actually draw a hard line. You have to accept that there is an element of fiction in rules and an element of rules in fiction. Yeah, I actually want to pick a specific fight with, with Andrew. We were discussing this earlier. So how, ma how many people have played War on Terror, the board game? Is this something? Yay! OK, so this is actually really good. You should all try it. Um, I Subversive political board. It, it, it comes with a balaclava with red letters that read evil. <laughs> and, and that's actually exactly what I wanted to talk about, which is, for me, actually, that game is a, a theme. I know you disagree, which is why I wanted to pick this fight. <laughs> that, that game, to me, was a theme first game, which is the theme of this kind of war on terror and um, like American and British and European forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and so forth and so on. Um, just that theme enabled some sort of kind of fun performance. So you get to put on this evil balaclava and act like a terrorist. You get to write secret notes that you pass to each other, but then if someone gets the right card, they get to read and intercept all these secret notes that you've written to each other. So in many ways, what I really like about that board game, it's, it's almost more a performance than it is, than it is a game. Um, some sort of like politically inspired, narratively inspired, where you get to like pretend you're a terrorist. Like how often do you get to do that. I mean, okay, maybe I'm incriminating myself here. Or something. <laughs> but, but, I mean, of course the mechanics matter. I'm not trying to say that they don't, but I think it, it um, and this, this is why I want to pick this fight with you, because I know you'll disagree, but I think that's a great game that in really embraces those performance elements in a way that a lot of other board games don't. So I just wanted to raise that with you. Um, well, I, I agree with you that, the, um, that it's a great game. And... Um, <laughs> And, and I, I agree also that the, the performance aspect is very important. And in fact, I think that role-playing um, is an essential component of playing games. And it, is, it lies at the heart of their power. And to be honest, before I ever tried to uh, design a game, I never thought I would find myself saying that because role-playing had this kind of uh, stigma attached to it. Um, so, um, so actually becoming the empire or becoming the terrorist player or whatever is, is, a, is a massive part of it and it imbues every action in the game with an extra level of meaning and humor and viciousness and all the rest of it. But um, the, 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 the bits that people find fun are actually incidental elements to the game and, and the game itself Though it was a response to a, th it was a, a thematic driven um, thing. It was a response to a real event. We um, we devised the mechanics around actual behaviours that we identified in the world, rather than the other way around. We didn't start off with a mechanic that we thought, well, what theme can we stick on the top of this that will will make it sell? And the only reason we did that is because we, we had no idea how to design a game. It was the first game we ever designed and we knew nothing about game design or the industry or manufacturing. Or We were quite ignorant is, is the basic uh, image I need to, to give across here. So all we did know how to do was uh, analyze the situation, try and break it down into who is against who, what goals do people have, um, what are the conflicting areas, and we turn those into mechanics. And now that, that has kind of become part of our philosophy in game design. Um, we, we're almost like the opposite of, of Reiner, I think, uh, where his games are very uh, mathematical and balanced. Our games are quite chaotic and, and human, and they are designed from, um, from well, I guess, almost like a sociological aspect, although that makes them sound more important than they are. They're, they're just kind of... Um, we, we, we pick a theme that interests us and we try and break that theme down into its component parts and we, we use human behaviours as, as mechanical drivers. 
What, were, what worried me about your game was that uh, when your game was brought to the Essen Fair the first year, uh, it was banned. We're, we're still banned. But you're still banned at, at the Essen Fair. Um, well, friends of mine, uh, they were selling your game uh, below the <laughs> counter. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and this was only done at, at the Sunday of the Essen Fair. And, um, well, it, 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 it brought something like, well, this, this game is commonly available in shops and you can buy it on the, in the internet. And why, oh why, can't this be on a board game fair? I thought it, it, it was ridiculous to see that, that, that a board game that drew attention to a political issue um, was banned on a, on a fair where you can buy, well, the, I think over 10,000 of copies of board games. I, I think um, it's straying away from the question a bit, and, and I'm sorry about that, but w what's interesting for us uh, is um, the answer to this question is, is why we chose the board game as a medium to do what we did. Because um, the origins of War and Terror, the board game, were, were just me and my friend watching the news uh, on the eve of the Iraq invasion and not quite believing it. And it struck us that there were elements of theatre and game in there, which you put those together and you've got a board game. And we also recognised instantly that the phrase war on terror, the board game, had contained within it its own humour, but more importantly, its own subversion. Because board gaming is an activity that is associated with families and, and wholesome pursuits, that we realized that you couldn't say the name of our product without engaging in that subversion. And, and I think that's why it's had so much um, controversy following it. And in fact, um, at the time the story broke, um, ITV, which is a major kind of news network in, in England, they told us explicitly that this was the reason they weren't going to do a, um, a story when pretty much every other major news network was. They said to us, that there was no way for them to cover the story without it belittling the war on terror, and that would cause offense. And, and I think it's quite funny that in, at that time, you know, the, even if offense is, is something that has to be avoided, that those people who most need protecting are, are kind of the warmongers and people who are waging war. And, and it, says a, it says a lot for like, the political climate at the time, but also the power of the medium in this instance was very much a part of the subversion and what we were trying to achieve. I think it's a dangerous game on two counts. And the first is that it is subversive and lots of people bought it because it was subversive. I would never have come across it if a friend of mine hadn't seen it, chuckled uh, and then bought it. But it's also an extremely dangerous game to play in warm climate countries because when you wear the balaclava, you do roast to death. <laughs> so uh, be warned if you live in a warm country uh, that you cannot actually play the game with the balaclava on safely. It's unhygienic. <laughs> it, it is, it gets a bit messy and it, and it was a, a purpose, it was a happy accident, we realised you literally got hot-headed when you wore the balaclava <laughs> and, and even with the best intentions, because um, one of the things that I like about the game is that you don't have to do bad stuff, if you can even define bad, but, um, but the game kind of forces you down this cul-de-sac where you end up being bad, nevertheless. Well, there are no good guys in it. There the are no good guys, no. The guys and the terrorists no, are and, and, guys. and one of the things that forces you to be bad is the balaclava, because you just get impatient and you get sweaty <laughs> and, 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 uh, and you even get g given really nasty cards as, as well when you're evil. So if you weren't evil before that point, you definitely are then, and, and it's a good job as well, because you have an explicit <laughs> label on your head saying it. But this is turning into a discussion about War and Terror the board game, and I, and I, I don't want to... Well, uh, I think generally the sort of theme of um, the power of board games for subversive play is an interesting one, so please carry on. I'm interested as whether Dr. Kinesia has made any game that he would consider subversive. <laughs> I, I fear I have to destroy you now, <laughs> because, <laughs> because um, I am actually... I am actually really trying to have good messages in my game. Uh, I don't see the point, staying away from this topic here, uh, I don't, because I don't know the game, unfortunately, uh, I don't see the point of making a game where you, where you run sky, uh, uh, planes into a skyscrapers. I think what we are doing here is essentially we are, we are essentially glorifying um, 
relatively bad events. We are glorifying uh, evil things in the world. And I don't see the point that we need to do that in the games because we are sending a message. We are inviting people to engage in the world. And I think I can send better and nicer messages in my games where people, I mean, I'm, I'm not a missionary. And my main point of designing games is to bring fun to the people, bring enjoyment to the people. But I'm also careful of what topics do I actually choose and what thoughts do I plant in the people's heads. Wasn't there a game about and grave robbing that you made, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, grave diggers. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, I mean, I, kn I know, the tricks are... If you do a war game, you don't do it in current times. You go 2,000 years back and it doesn't hurt that much. And, and, and uh, yes, there, there are fine lines. I think it's more the spirit of what you do. If, you, if it's a funny, I mean, these guys are dead, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, I did game, do a game called Looting London, yes? It's, uh, <laughs> actually, I didn't. <laughs> it, it, actually, it was a Scotland Yard game. <laughs> Um, which then became a German game, which name escapes me now, oh my God. Um, and then it was published in America as Looting London. So, you, I mean, I'm not, I'm not pushing it to the publisher side, even so all the things you mentioned were done by the publisher, not by me. But I'm <laughs> responsible for it and I have an approval right, so I, I, I have to put my head down for that. Uh, no, the, the point is, is more serious. I mean, you can take fun out of it and you have to see what you actually do in the game. The title is one thing and you often choose a title which is much more um, aggressive and much more attention uh, uh, taking. If you look the, at the game and you play the game and you essentially ask yourself, what am I doing in the game? What role am I taking? What ambitions do I have? Then I want actually these ambitions to be positive and actually making a good contribution to the world rather than making a negative and evil contribution. That's essentially in a nutshell what I say. And then in your Euphrate and Tigger, I'm destroying completely um, <laughs> kingdoms. But that's true. <laughs> um, I, I was just not that I want to use your own words against you but you, you did start off with the opening slide was games are about real life and I, and I am behind that 100% and part of real life is the bad stuff that happens as well so I completely agree with you that um, you don't have to have a game where you get points for flying planes into tw t twin towers uh, but interestingly, that was the very objection to uh, one of our, the objections, objections to our game when it was released. Um, people kind of assumed the worst. People, we're, we're in a kind of a society where people assume that if you're going to do something provocative, well, it has to be meaningless and sick. And people ascribed things to our game without even looking at it, let alone playing it, that were way kind of more depraved than we could ever come up with. So um, I... I think that games um, can, and in fact, I, I would say games have a duty to address the, the bad and the difficult and complex subjects in life, as well as like the, the happy kind of moving pigs into different pen side of life. Um, and, and, and games are uniquely suited for tackling complex subjects because they're interactive. Yes. Uh, I think the topic of running planes into skyscrapers is actually a good example because what I'm criticizing is if, you, if the game gives the player the role of maneuvering these planes into the skyscrapers. I think if you want to make it as a topic, it's a dangerous topic, but if you see it from the other side, if you don't take the evil position, if you don't invite the... I mean, I think we agree the planes are evil. So, um, if you don't give the player, so to speak, the personification, I'm now on the evil side and I'll do it, and I'm glorifying what I'm doing. It, But if I see it from the other side, the topic is not the issue. The, the, the topic is, is dangerous, but it's fine. The question is what perspective and what objectives do you give the player? So what role do you give the player? If I invite players to become pilots, suicide pilots, and go into skyscrapers, I would not want to do that. If I'm taking the other side and say, how can I prevent things, it's a dangerous theme, but then I think, so I'm probably, I'm probably taking touch judgments here in the game, but I think there's a line which I personally, and it's, it's a decision for everybody personally, would not want to cross.
And by the way, I managed to get the second microphone onto our side. So they are out, oh, yeah. out, they are out good, maneuver good work, now. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we'll dominate this one, don't worry. Um, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and I think we're in agreement that it's an issue of treatment um, rather than subject matter. But my big thing is that uh, games are a, uh, a non linear way of, of communicating. It's, it's interactive and it's two-way. And the power of games is that you can give the tools to the player and allow them to construct their own narrative. Now, if you don't ever give the player the ability to be the, the baddie or the bad guy, they will never come to their own conclusions about the issue. And so as a, as a designer, for, uh, I think part of the problem with War and Terror and as a, as a designer of that game, my main role was to try and be ambiguous about almost everything in the game. So if I'm never going to be a terrorist and I don't get the perspective on the world? Um, I wouldn't say that explicitly, but um, in the game you realize that as soon as you are violent, and it's not about being a, a terrorist necessarily, as, a, as the Empire player, you can drop nukes on each other, and that's way more destructive and violent than any act of terrorism. So, Can I just, you, in, can I just yeah. interject about the game design? This mm. is a game in which the Empires are the ones who cause the problem, because they create the terrorists they, they, all the way through. They, they do fund the terrorists. Not, yeah. not all of it, but they, no, they but actually they fund terrorism. They create the situations which yeah. empower the terrorists, yes. and that's kind of the political message that, that goes on there. Yeah, yeah, definitely one of the messages. And, and, and like I say, it, it, everyone took exception with things like the Suicide Bomber card. But as I say, there are cards that are much more devastating and they belong to the, the sanctioned tactics of, of the Empire. And, and those things are never questioned. So it's only when you, when you give the players the ability to be the unsanctioned, the, the baddies, that you start this period of, of reflection on what it is you're doing. And, and you get into a kind of equivalent situation where you think, well, I just destroyed you know, 100,000 people using this method, and it's unsanctioned, and I feel a bit bad about it. I'm wearing a battle with evil on the head. And then, uh, but as an empire, I'm the one who created this situation, and I also just wiped out our whole continent, and I'm guilty of genocide. I'd just like to name-check Flying Buffalo's Nuclear War, which is a game that I love, it, it was uh, a big which influence. I never had any qualms about blowing up the yeah. world. In fact, I, I, I delightedly <laughs> attempted to blow up the world in that game. And I, I, playing War on Terror did make me think in different ways uh, about situations that I already had strong political uh, feelings about. And in that respect, I think it is, it's a successful piece of social commentary. Uh, so I, I, I'm in defense of it. And also, Dr. Knizia, you say you want to put positive things out into the world, but my wife and I have reached the point of divorce playing Blue Moon and Lost Cities. <laughs> I, I, I actually have a, a brief anecdote on, this, on the subject of divorce. Um, <laughs> my parents-in-law uh, are both diplomats. Were, my father-in-law was an ambassador in the Middle East, uh, where there isn't much to do after nightfalls. You can't go out drinking. Uh, so they used to play board games, and one of the games they used to play, being diplomats, was diplomacy. Ha ha ha! And one evening, they they went over to the residence of the Russian ambassador and his wife with another couple, um, sat down, started playing diplomacy. Halfway through, the Russian ambassador and his wife get into a screaming argument. She storms out, and a month later, they're divorced. Um, and if anyone can handle diplomacy, you would have thought it would be professional career diplomats. I, I suspect the bloom was probably off the rose in that particular relationship already, but I like to ascribe it to the tricky problem of controlling the English Channel. <laughs> no, the... <laughs> the experience is actually that those people who do it can take the games the least about the topic because the diplomats have those clear thinkings in their heads so what you do in the games is much more outrageous to them it's the same as the critics they, they are happy that the journalists they're happy to criticize you if you criticize them they almost die of it it's nice i i do want to say also in defense of of playing the terror since we have like an academic audience i think sometimes this notion of like dark play i'm thinking of you know schnetzner's works or something um is we don't I, I wish we did see that more, actually, in board games. And I think there is a joy in and of itself of dark play or of subversion, which, which was the question. So this, this fact that you do get to... Now, whether that is politically problematic or not, yeah, that is, you know, an interesting debate we could have. But I, I do think it is actually really fun, just purely, like, aside from politics, because it feels subversive. Like, you're not supposed to be playing a terrorist. So there's, 
I think subversion is fun in and of itself and is really an underused kind of yep. part of playing games. But I think this is one of the, power, the really powerful things about board games and social gaming around a table that you kind of lose in the online space or, or just in front of a screen. It's, it's a phrase I, I hate. It's, it's the magic circle, the game space that arises around a group of people playing with a set of rules in which normal rules are transcended and replaced by a new set that do allow you to, to do nasty things to each other, to, to lie and to steal, and in some cases, Steve Jackson's Illuminati card game, it specifically says in the rules, cheating is permitted. Um, all these things that in normal society, completely taboo, in, in a board game, you can do to your friends. Because and, and they will forgive you as, you hope they'll forgive you as soon yeah. as the game is over. <laughs> can, can I just yeah. say one thing, though, about um, the, your Illuminati example? I'm not, for me, I'm, I think you're partially right, but I think also, and so in that game it does specify how you can cheat in the rules, but I think precisely for that reason, it doesn't feel like cheating. It's like it's extra, it's extra rules yeah. that are themed as cheating, and I think that's one of the weaknesses of that game. Um, by contrast, the, the thing I really like about War on Terror, the board game, is it's broken in a real sense. Like, the, the weirdest thing about this game is the victory conditions aren't really clear, so you can win if the empires kind of kill all the terrorists and decide, okay, we're going to share the victory, they win world peace. Or you can, kind of win, you can kind of win as the terrorists as well. So you start getting into this conversation, which is like, well, is it better to win as a terrorist than as three empires? Or is it better to win alone as an empire rather than share the victory with some other person? So I think that, that kind of really... And, and the rules actually say nothing about how we should evaluate these. And I think that's the strength of your game. So I... In terms of this question of subversion, I think sometimes maybe it's the wrong approach, at least with Illuminati, in terms of the pure joy. Like, I'm not sure it's as joyful to cheat in that game because the rules told me I yeah. could cheat. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. With, uh, having mentioned Illuminati, I have to uh, ask, how many people here have played uh, Junta or Junta? Ah, uh, there are some people. See, here, here is a game that I think embodies in the board game context uh, Castronova's idea of the magic circle being leaky because playing this in all-nighters at university, the bitchiest behavior would come out of the players. Everyone thinking, oh, it's only a game and at the end of the game it won't matter. But of course, at the end of the game, suddenly the recriminations start and it's like bridge night in a, an old couple's house. And everyone's like, why didn't you back me when I did blah, blah, blah? Well, you made me the Admiral of the Navy and blah, blah, blah. And it gets quite heated after the game ends because you, you don't quite separate yourself from those real life situations. Um, I, I just want to kind of add on to that uh, that one of the power of um, board games is that it sets up a confrontation without necessarily being confrontational. Now, now there are famous examples of course of, of recriminations existing beyond the, the game and God knows our game during its testing phase was responsible for its fair share of breakups um, and, and get togethers, I have to say, actually. I, I, I met my wife over eating one of her secret messages. Um, actually, that was a low point. Um, and um, <coughs> where was I? Uh, yeah, OK, so um, the, the, uh, and I'm sorry to be so uh, self publicizing and mentioning my game again, but. The war on terror, the thing that it enabled people to do was talk about terrorism. And it came out in 2006 when the Iraq war was going very, very badly. Um, I, I mean, there were huge uh, death tolls being reported every day. And for most people, the Iraq war was the war on terror. And um, terrorism was a word that uh, came with it um, a lot of baggage, much more than it does today. I think it's hard to kind of cast your mind back kind of five years, but you wouldn't voluntarily strike up a conversation about terrorism in, uh, in strange company, even, even you know, amongst your friends. It, it, it was a hard thing to do. But if you set up this confrontation that is abstract and distance from you, but you're also taking part in it, then you can explore certain ideas and behaviors through that game, and you can confront each other and each other's ideologies and ideas through that game without actually getting into the tricky realm and the emotional realm of a political debate. And again, that links back to what I said earlier about role-playing being a very powerful element of, of all games. Um, I, I think that's what kind of lies in the heart of, um, of, of serious games and, and things like that, and that's why I'd like to see more of them. 
Okay. Uh, on the subject of role playing, I just want to say, does anyone playing Monopoly actually really imagine they're the hat or the iron? <laughs> Every time. <laughs> so I'm going to ask well, I can see the one dog. more, I guess, official question, and then we're going to open up to questions from the audience, and a lot of people are sort of going, hey, hey, me, me. Um, so I wanted you guys to take advantage of the fact that here's a room full of academics who are passionate about games, care about games, many are really fans of board games and so on. So here's an opportunity for you to ask us and say, well, what should we be working on? What problems should we be exploring or, or, or facing or examining? I, I think really what academics can do for, for board game designers like us is, is hire us to come in as visiting lecturers um, and, and pay us. Because God knows we're not making, well, with the exception, I suspect, of, of the man to my left, and not making a huge amount of money out of it. I think there are some interesting topics, even so I earlier said um, replacing the game designers by computers or by robots is not the best idea, but <laughs> we'll, we'll watch the space over the next 15 years. Um, I think um, we had the chat just before we started here. Uh, game theory is actually uh, a big topic which could be applied much more intensively to, to board games and to computer games uh, as, as nice, first of all as nice examples, but secondly also as a good analysis of uh, how do people actually play, because sometimes, yes, we have the prisoner's dilemma, and it's a very good example, but it's not directly that relevant, whereas lots of people play lots of games, and looking uh, into the theoretical outcome, how should I behave? And then, of course, there is lots of imperial data from the players, actually, statistics you can probably get and say how people actually behave in this. I think there could be quite some interesting parts in it. Well, I, I have to agree with you on that part. Um, in my opinion, when one is at a traffic light and the light is red, you can make a number of decisions. You can stop and comply with law. Or otherwise, you can try to bend the rules and um, cross the line and cross the red light. And, but then again, if there is a, a police cop behind the traffic light and he sees you, you will get a penalty. Um, what we do um, constantly is a bit of game theory in our minds. We're constantly, with every decision we make, we're looking at the situation, we're looking at the options we can see, we bring them together, and that's the part where uh, the, the, the complete um, psychological uh, part com uh, comes in. And, well, in my opinion, we should look at more directions on gaming. Um, mathematics is working with game theory. Um, psychologists are working with games. Um, there's an, a group in the Netherlands and in several other countries, and you're involved in it as well, uh, board game, board, international board game studies. And, um, and that part, they, they, they take a look at old games, antique games, um, study why were the, those rules used in the past, what happened to those rules, what, what is the influence of old games to the games we are using at this moment. Uh, how, how can we bring all the, those ideas together? And um, what I see is that all sorts of people in all sorts of fields are working with games, and we don't bring anything together. And that's something that surprises me, because we can learn from all the kind of uh, academic studies we are doing from each of the different directions, and when we bring them together, we can create something more. I, uh, I criticized in my paper presentation earlier the fact that uh, game studies people have a nasty but understandable tendency to write about the games they're actually playing themselves. Uh, and whilst a little bit of that is probably uh, unavoidable, I do think that we do need to make more of an effort to uh, look at games from a wider remit, and that means looking at board games as well as uh, video games. Uh, Scrabble, for instance, uh, I've seen a lot of papers on EVE Online and World of Warcraft, but very few papers on Scrabble. Uh, 150 million uh, copies, you mentioned 80 million uh, Facebook players. Uh, I think uh, three board games have beaten that. Trivial Pursuit, 80 million. Scrabble, 150 million. Monopoly, 200 million. Although m most of those Monopoly sets, as Yehuda suggests, don't actually get played, they're just bought. 
Uh, I, I would really like us as a field to um, look at the field of games as a whole and decide where is actually worth investigating on the basis of the wider interest in, in games and not just on our, our interests in games. Yeah, it's a more up-to-date example. I believe Settlers of Catan has outsold Halo three to one. Um, j just a quick point, so, something that, that I, I see, uh, and I fully admit that, that that might not make it true, it's just something I see, is, is a kind of a fixation on, on medium. And, and for me, the important uh, aspect of games is the, is the playing. Uh, and and it would be nice to see um, something that, that wasn't so bothered about the boundaries between, well, this, I know this, the digital is part of the name of this conference, but <laughs> something that, that didn't, you know, uh, stop at digital and then treat board games as something different and then stop there and treat RPGs as something different and stop there and treat, you know, party games as something different. They all share uh, so, um, some essential and common qualities. Yes, there's a... a an absolute demonstrable flow from the history of games, which predates written language, as I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, right up to the present day. The evolution of the uh, experience and levelling mechanics in Dungeons & Dragons through to today's Facebook games from Zynga. It's absolutely traceable every step of the way. Um, teach your students about the history of games, that um, games transcend language, tabletop games transcend language, Nine Men's Morris boards crop up all over what was the medieval world, and this is a game you didn't need to speak the same language as someone to play and play well. Um, and get them to play these games as well. Gaming, games are a language, games are a vocabulary. Every game that you play, you add another word, another tool to your toolkit. Um, the more games that your students will play, the better games they will design in, in their exercises. I've seen this myself. I lectured at the University of Westminster on their game design courses. Um, the, the more games, the different games that you can introduce students to. And it's much easier to introduce students to a, a, a tabletop game um, and get them to play in depth than it is perhaps a complex MMO or something like that. Settlers of Catan, what, it's a 60-minute, 90-minute game. Um, four players simultaneously, six if you get the expansion. Um, they will all then, they may not understand it, but at least they'll they'll understand how it works. The idea of the competitive, collaborative nature of, of the, the Euro games, and, and it's, this is a vital part of, of any game designer, any serious game designer's vocabulary these days. Um, so my request is slightly less practical, but I, I'd, love, <laughs> I'd love to see more high-level work on like, um, high performance, uh, like for example, really pro Magic the Gathering players. Um, and I'm thinking of something like um, Henry Lowood's work on like eSports. I'm, I'm looking at some of my ITU colleagues out there who do stuff on eSports. I think especially some of these really hardcore um, card games that go pro, I think something really beautiful happens in these really um, skilled play moments. It almost becomes a different game, so to speak. And I'd love to see, I think, um, academics and ethnographers and so forth could do a really beautiful job um, articulating that moment and explaining that to other people. Uh, so. Okay, thank you. Questions oh, just me? quickly, oh. one last thing on this. Uh, just to give props out where they're due, there are two groups of people here who presented papers on live action role playing and I, I, I tip my virtual hat to you because I've never seen uh, anybody present a paper on live action role playing in any context ever. So congratulations, whoever you are. <laughs> And I'd, I'd just like to say, as a, as a final point, um, yes, more, more high-level work. I mean, we're, we're all familiar with IBM build, spending millions of dollars to build Deep Blue to, to beat the greatest um, chess players in the world. Let's have equal amounts of work and equal amounts of budget dedicated to, to building computers that can beat the greatest players at uh, Cat Cat Cook Night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, questions from the audience? I think there was... Yeah, this uh, really brings it back to the long discussion you had, and, and I waved in the beginning of it. So, uh, but still, I have this question, um, like uh, like you brought up in the keynote, games and to design games is to produce art, which kind of makes games art. And I'm not sure where I stand myself because it's difficult. But if games are art, which I think it's kind of also obliged to reflect upon the society and maybe take up the difficult questions and make something out of it and to bring something to people who play. Uh, you end up dangerously near uh, learning games, which has a, a bunch of problems with it. 
but uh, I just would like to hear your view on, on, on although I take it back to the whole discussion, the, the art, games as art and its uh, role as um, art generally have worked during the centuries. I just want to say really like some of the greatest art pieces of the 20th century are literally board games, right? Like you think of Yoko Ono's white chess or other Fluxus art pieces. So like the answer is yes. And they're already some of the most famous art pieces of the 20th century. Just as a quick historical point. Um, I think in Germany they have understood it better than we do. Because in Germany there's a game archive. And the game archive is nowadays in Nuremberg. Uh, they have a collection of the complete German uh, game, uh, the, the complete number of games that have been produced in Germany ever since the end of the world, uh, the Second World War. Um, then there is a museum in uh, Chemnitz, and uh, they have a, a, co a collection of all the games that were produced during the, uh, the Dutch Democratic Republic. Um, that's, that's in essence, one should collect these games, otherwise it's not possible for future generations to study them. What were the ideas behind these games? Uh, were they to, uh, to, to instruct people? Were they to, to uh, show people what, what we were doing in our time? To learn from the prog progression that has been made in, in games? Um, what surprises me is that, that um, there are a few people in the Netherlands who are really collecting games, but they are really having trouble to uh, bring these collections to, to places where they can be kept after they have died. So there is a collection of which I know uh, of a person who um, has, well, she, she, she collected all kinds of games of the goose. And she has a collection that dates back to 7050 or something. And after she will die, those, that complete collection will disappear. Sid Saxon, an author in the United States, all his game designs were, well, mostly given away after he had died. They, ju they just organized an auction on the internet. And, and those games should be part of a collection of a war museum. And the same thing happens. They will die and the games will disappear. And it's very hard, even nowadays, to find um, games from the Greek period. There's hardly any museum that can you sh uh, show you a game that has been made in the Greek period. There's a lot of material available from the Roman period. There's a lot of material available from the Egypt period, but there's hardly anything from the Greek period. So in that way, you lose a very important part of history on gaming. Um, on the subject of games and art, I want to make um, a just a quick tour of the topic. Uh, most discussion of what is art ends up being discussions of what is culturally esteemed as art. Um, so to circumvent that problem, uh, what I do in imaginary games is I use this philosopher, uh, Kendall Walton, who uh, says that uh, fiction, um, novels, uh, films, uh, TV shows, plays, all fiction is continuous with children's games of make-believe, and thus it, all fiction is effectively a game of make-believe. The same idea appears in Roger Kerwa. He has exactly uh, the same wider view. I think being French, where jeu means both play and game, encourages this wider perspective. Uh, I think in English, where they're different words, we, we, uh, we tend to see them separately. So my argument for the case for board games and video games qualifying for art is effectively that since, since all artworks are already games, it's ridiculous to suggest that things that are also games are not artworks. But the question of which of those uh, games and which of those artworks is, is worthy of cultural esteem is a sort of a, a separate uh, a question, and one that can be deba debated uh, infinitely. Uh, we, we seem to be lacking uh, critics who are able to, uh, to really wade in on this topic, and something I would like to see is, is better game criticism. Less reviews, more criticism. Uh, when I, because you, you um, uh, mentioned it, when I said in the keynote, 
uh, I see game design more as an act of art. For me, it's actually, I'm not, I'm not my, my main statement was not every game is a piece of art. For me, it's more the practical, how do I go about it? The act of creating it. And the, correct of, the act of creating a game, for me, f feels much less like a piece of scientific methodology. For me, I can best define it as an act of art, creating art, uh, how I would act as an artist. So I don't have this methodology. I, uh, I think you can des actually, I think you can design games in both ways. You can do it scientific or uh, in an artistic way. But I think for the ambitions I have, the artistic way works much better because I'm trying to create new things uh, in a way which is much more impressed with art, expressed with art than with science. I think the trouble with, with designing art is that art does not, I can't remember who says it, art does not come and lie in the beds we make for it. Uh, it might be Duchamp, I don't think it was. It sounds like Duchamp. Um, he also said art is anything done by an artist, which I think is one of the points. We're not artists, we're games people. Therefore, Speak for yourself. According to the cultural mores and standards of the day, what we do is not art. Our games are, I think the, the answer is not yet. Give it, give it time. Um, when... The first novels came out. They were regarded as a trash ephemeral medium. Theatre, Shakespeare's plays were a trash medium. They were not expected to survive his, his lifetime. Um, cinema, the early films, trash, dis discarded by the critics who had no interest in it. Modern games, exactly the same. I think 30, 40 years' time, people will look back and go, bloody hell, that's good stuff. And that's when the museums will open. I still think Toro Watani's Pac-Man is as important an artwork as the Campbell soup cans that were made in the 60s. Yeah, I, I, I agree, but I'm a games designer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the final word, anybody? Just games a, are uh, good. a brief self-serving uh, anecdote, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, <laughs> I almost didn't tell this uh, because it was referring back to War and Terror again. But um, d War and Terror was uh, exhibited as art in the Berlin Academy of Arts during a, um, a show for uh, security, uh, art in the time of security. And I found what was interesting kind of watching people for a very uncomfortable half hour in that room where it was encased in a glass case is that, of course, no one could interact with it. Um, and people would come up to it, file along the glass case, peer in, read the note by the side of it, um, and look at the board laid out and the balaclava and they'd point and, and then they'd move on. So I, I think there's something a bit dangerous about declaring games as art because um, it sounds like it sounds like collectively we have a bit of an inferiority complex and we're aspiring to this higher thing, which in my mind is a little bit static. Um, and, and games don't belong in museums, they don't belong in art galleries. They, they, they belong, uh, they need to be experienced, and they need to be played. Um, yeah, I mean, I think games should be noisy as well, so that wouldn't go down that well in libraries. I, I do want to just say, and this is also a little self-promotional, but like, Eric and me just showed games at MoMA in New York City, and they were really active, kind of physical performative games. So yeah, actually, at least computer games are like doing pretty well for themselves on the cultural front. So I don't know, maybe actually board games need to, maybe you guys need to catch up. I, I, don't, I don't know, but, but I, will, I will say is that. Okay. I, actually, um, I had a piece in that. I, was, I worked on We Tell Stories. So I think we're out of time. Uh, we wanted to have a few more questions, but uh, I believe most of the panelists will be around, and so if you want to really mob them with more questions and so on, I think they, they're looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so please Bias join drinks. me in uh, thanking our panelists.